This is Football Night in America, served by Applebee's. Hey, it's the Super Wild Card Weekend wrap-up. Devin McCourty, Jason Garrett, Matthew Barry, I'm Mike Florio. We got a lot to talk about. Not as much as we thought we'd have to talk about because one of the games got moved, but still, plenty of action. And we got to start with the stunner of the weekend. Table set for the Cowboys. This is the year they're going to get back to the NFC Championship for the first time since 1995. They didn't count on the Packers. We didn't count on the Packers. Nobody counted Devin McCourty on the Green Bay Packers today. Yeah, but it was like, there was all these rumblings like, all right, well, Dallas better be careful. Jordan Love's been playing really well. This Green Bay team, they have the chance to maybe run the ball and do all those things, but it just wasn't what we, what we expected. This Dallas team is so talented, and they play so well at home, undefeated at home, that we thought no matter what kind of punches or plan that Green Bay had, Dallas would overcome. To me, the disappointing point was they just never showed up. Defensively, ever since the Seahawks game, I felt like – this Dallas defense just was happy with, you know, let's just kind of die slow. Let's not be aggressive, get in their face. They're going to drive down. Maybe we stop them in the red zone. Maybe we don't, but our offense will go score points. Today, that didn't happen. Green Bay got a couple turnovers, changed the game, and then every time the Dallas defense took the field, Green Bay marched down and scored another touchdown. And to me, that was a disappointing part because that was the strength of this team all season. Yeah, no doubt. You know, when you're a coach and a player – uh, in the NFL, at the end of it, you want to represent yourself the right way. You want to be who you are, the best version of yourself, if you will, particularly in a big moment like the playoffs. And the Cowboys weren't that. And, and you said it. They have not lost a home game since the opener against Tampa Bay in week one of last year. They've been so dominant. So when the dominoes fell in the way where Philadelphia went by the wayside, the Cowboys get the opportunity to be the two seed and host these games. You say, wow, this is easy street. You know, I see them going to San Francisco in the championship game. They're going to win these games. They're going to continue to play how they have played. And it was nothing like that today. Hats off to Green Bay. Jordan Love has been outstanding. The last month of the season, their defense has really shown up. But to me, this was more about the Cowboys not fulfilling their potential. And that's probably what's most disappointing for all Cowboy fans. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I'll just say this. I don't think people realize the Cowboys haven't stopped the run all year long. They came into this game ranked 29th in success rate against rush plays. The problem is, is their offense has been so good, they've been blowing out teams, so teams weren't running against them in the second half. So the stats might look like they didn't give up a lot of runs, but if you watch it, like, you can run on the Cowboys, and you've been able to run on them all year long. And so Aaron Jones, who, by the way, could never get a full-time role when Mike McCarthy was his coach in Green <laughs> Bay, comes in here, 21 for 118, three touchdowns, plays phenomenal, and then you, you mix that with the fact that, yeah, Joe Barry's defense has been under fire and like, oh, Dak is going to just roll him everything like that. And just, uh, listen, the first interception was just a great play. It was great. I don't think that's an interception on Dak, just a great play by the kid. But he throws another pick in his own, in his own red zone. They get another cheap score there. He actually should have thrown a third pick in the red zone at the end of the first half. And just, you know, give credit to the Green Bay defense. They did exactly, I mean, sorry, to the Dallas defense because, I'm sorry, to the Green Bay defense because... They confounded what was a really good passing offense. I've been a firm believer Sorry. that if you're going to have any chance to win in Dallas, you've got to weather the storm because before you know it, it's going to be 14-0, 17-0, yep. and it's over. You pin their ears back. Michael Parsons has five sacks, and it's over. The Packers were the storm today. They got out to the big lead. And i got to go back to 2020. They made that decision, controversial at the time, to trade up at the bottom of round one to get Jordan Love. And then they put him on ice, created a mess, in the organization, Aaron Rodgers wasn't happy about it. Nobody called him to tell him about it. It created enough of an impetus for him to be MVP a couple of straight years. Then 2022, that was that. Now Jordan Love takes over, and it took a little while for him to get going. But as the season went on, he got better and better. And for him to go in there and put 48 points on the Cowboys, incredible. And it's a great sign of the Packers possibly being able. He's got a long way to go. But to, to, to think that they could go from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers to somebody who can come in like this and in his first playoff game ever go to Dallas and beat the number two seed, first time seven seeds ever beaten number two seed, do what he did, you got to be feeling pretty good if you're a Packers fan no matter what happens next week, Devin. I mean, it's been cool all season to talk about this. Just the idea of this organization, they figured it out. They know how to pick quarterbacks. And 
I remember being a player and seeing that and saying, that's ridiculous. You have Aaron <laughs> Rodgers and you move up to draft a quarterback. And I wasn't scouting quarterbacks. I'm like, Jordan Love comes in. Like, that's a terrible decision. And now you look. And as many teams are out here searching year after year for a quarterback, and they're just saying, no, this is simple. You know, we'll draft Brad Favre. We'll bring in Aaron Rodgers. And then we're going to do the same thing, replicate that, bring in a guy. You're going to get a little angry, but eventually you're going to leave, and this guy's going to be a great player for us, and that's why we did it. So hats off to Green Bay. It's beyond making the right evaluation. It's the approach. You have the established quarterback. You bring the next guy in. You pay a high price for it. Aaron Rodgers is a first-round pick. But then you let him sit. We live in a world where everybody wants everything right now. So we're going to draft the guy. We put him in on day one. He's got to be our day one starter. He's got to, hey, we draft him with the fourth pick of the draft. And so their approach is so much better, so much more deliberate, and it allows for the transition to happen. When you're a fourth-year player as a quarterback and you go into a game after you've had countless reps in, in OTAs, in training camp, you've played in preseason games, you're so much more ready. Sure, you don't have game experience, but you're more ready for that experience. They've done it twice. For 30 years, they had two of the all-time greats. This might go on for 45 years. The kid was fantastic today. Yeah, you know what? And so much of the talk out of this game is going to be Dallas and the future Mike McCarthy, and I get all that and the disappointment of the Cowboys season, but I'm glad you brought that up, Coach, in terms of the success of the front office of the Green Bay Packers. And it's not just the development of Jordan Love, who is, like, if we hadn't seen C.J. Stroud and we're going to get to him, like, <laughs> he, Jordan Love would be the talk of, of this weekend, and rightfully so. But not just Jordan Love, but finding all these young receivers. Romeo Dobbs has a huge <laughs> game, right? Like, we saw a big play from uh, from Luke Musgrave. Dontavian Wicks catches the touchdown. Like, we saw nothing from Jaden Reed, and yet he's somebody who's been really good down yeah. the stretch. They've developed all these young wide receivers. All of a sudden, and Jordan Love did a great job of distributing the ball, taking what the defense was giving him, and give credit to Matt LaFleur. I thought that was a master class in terms of play calling today. Matthew mentioned the future of Mike McCarthy, the coach of the Cowboys. Coach Garrett, you know Jerry Jones a thousand times better than any of us could ever hope to. What do you think happens next? You know, I, I think there's a misperception about Jerry Jones. When we had some rough moments, we lost in the final eight, the divisional round, three times. Disappointing losses. You're a step away from going to the NFC Championship game. And that's when Jerry Jones was at his best. Mm -hmm. Certainly, he's as disappointed as anybody. He can be emotional. He's passionate about it. But after the game, the next day was always very supportive of me, the staff, the players, said the right things. But then you pull back and you say, okay, we fell short. What do we need to do? Mm -hmm. And after every one of those years, even though we had gone that far, we made changes. There were changes to the coaching staff. There were changes to the roster. And I don't think there's going to be any – that will be the case this week. I do think he'll handle things the right way the next couple days, but then they're going to dig in. They're going to decide what's the next step. How do you break through losing in this wild card round like they've done two out of the last three years? It might involve Mike McCarthy, other guys on the staff, certainly some players. There will be some changes down there. Yeah, I'm always interested in we watch some of these, I would say, legendary owners. But now as they get older, maybe some of the decision-making and things you would do before, you would kind of – see it as a, we have time, we can build. I think this situation right now is kind of like we haven't won or been in these big games that I want to be in for a long time. I don't know how much time's left. I want this now. And you look out there and you're like, wow, you know, I've, I've always watched from afar this Patriots organization. This one guy, Bill Belichick, has run this organization. He's done this, he's done that. They talk about who he drafts. He talks about the coaching staff, the players. Man, what if... His last hurrahs, he comes here for two or three years and we go to the promised land and we win. Because the team has a ton of talent. It's totally different from where Bill Belichick's coming from with the Patriots and that team. This team's loaded with talent. I think that's that's like that, you know, the pretty girl that comes to the first dance of the school year where you're like, man, she's a new girl. I've heard about her from the other town. I might want to see if I want to date or ask her to dance. <laughs> you, you often hear that phrase, oh, this team is just a quarterback away. Just a quarterback away. I feel like there's going to be a lot of people, and I'll be, I'm in this camp, the Cowboys are a coach away. I, you know, in all seriousness, like Mike McCarthy just hasn't been able to get past this step. Um, and I think that if they had lost this game in heartbreaking fashion, a bad call, a fumble, okay. But they gave up almost 50. Almost 50 at home to a seven seed. And they came out flat, and they didn't look. It didn't. 
they didn't, you know, he's calling the plays offensively, and they didn't get going until they were down by three or four touchdowns. You know what I mean? Like, it just, it was just surprising to me. I, I just, listen, you never want to root for anyone to be fired, but I just, I don't, I don't think once Jerry Jones looks at all of this and sees the whole, and you know, as J Jason was saying, when he considers everything, I would, personally, I would be very surprised if they don't make a change at the top. That's, that's me personally. And then the last thing I'm just going to say, Jason Garrett played the Packers tougher. Des caught it, damn it. <laughs> Des caught it. How old were you in 1995? Um, seven. That's the last time the Cowboys played in the NFC Championship game. That is astounding to me. And Bill Parcells always said, if they want me to cook the meal, they got to let me shop for the groceries. There is a well-stocked kitchen in Dallas, and Belichick just needs to be Emerald, right? Go in there and whip it up and get that Super Bowl championship. We'll be looking for you for that report for. soon. All right. <laughs> Another game that uh, the outcome was not nearly as surprising. The conditions were in Kansas City <laughs> on Saturday night. Jason was there. He's still thawing out from the experience. 26-7 to win by Kansas City. Coach, give me your big takeaway from seeing that one in person. I was so impressed with Kansas City's mentality. We went to practice on Thursday. Travis Kelsey, Willie Gay running around in shorts. <laughs> now, it wasn't as cold on Thursday as it was mm. on Saturday, but you can see they were going to be unfazed by these conditions. You know, one of the all-time great coaches, one of the all-time great quarterbacks getting together, and their mindset and mentality in this game was, we're going to go take it. Forget about this, these conditions. We're going to go be the Chiefs, be who we have been. And, and in the big moments, that's what they did. They came out throwing the ball on first and second down right away. It was minus four degrees. Right? It was not easy. But they were going to show the world that, hey, we're attacking this thing. They make the conversion to Kelsey, and then here comes Isaiah Pacheco. And that set the tone for them. And they went and grabbed the game. I've been really impressed with Mahomes for a long time. For me, he was as impressive in this game as I've ever seen them. And they have a nice energy and a nice mojo about them right now. They're going to be a hard out going forward. Yeah, what I loved about the game was we talked about this defense all year. And sometimes you get in these playoff games and the defense plays well, but everybody still talks about Mahomes in the offense yeah. and the defense might slip up or something. This defense huh. came out and they said, we're going to be physical. And what I love about playoff football is it's not about just being physical up front. Everyone talks about that. I thought they're a secondary. Legereus Sneed, he fakes like he's going to quick jam Tyreek Hill. He gets a false start penalty. The very next play, he gets right back in Tyreek Hill's face, quick jams him to the ground. And I thought that was the difference in the game. Kansas City's defense said, we're going to be physical. We're going to stop the run. Every chance we get to hit you in the secondary, your top players, whether it's Tyreek Hill, whether it's Jalen Waddle, whether it's Achan, we're going to gang tackle. We're going to keep coming and, and do it over and over again. And I thought that was a big difference. And that cold weather, when you're ready to come as a defense and just hit people downhill, put your pads on them, Eventually, they say no moss. They don't want to go out there. And I thought Kansas City brought that kind of energy to Miami. They really did. The, the, Chief, the Dolphins were one of 12 on third down. I mean, you know, like, they just could not get a drive sustained. Like, and so the Chiefs did a great job. And it's so weird because, yes, everyone's always going to talk about Patrick Mahomes, and rightfully so. But I think Andy Reid's done a really nice job of realizing what his team is. And it's, it's not a typical Andy Reid team. Right? It is, it is a, you know, we got to play good defense and run the ball. Isaiah Pacheco, to your point, 24 carries in this one, almost 90 yards. He scores the touchdown as well. They ran the ball well. They played good defense, and they made the big plays in the passing game when they needed to. They've really found something in Rasheed Rice, now a full-time role, the rookie, coming up big for them as well. And I also just want to say, I know so much is going to be on the Dolphin side of the ball, where they like they can't beat the big play, the big the big team, uh, they they're one in six against teams with a winning winning record this year. I get that, but give Mike McDaniel credit and give Vic Fangio credit because they came out there and they played tough despite the fact that Mostert wasn't 100 percent, Jalen Waddle wasn't 100 percent. They're missing five starters on defense. Two of their key backups are also out. They were so beat up going into that game on the road at Arrowhead, always a tough place to play, and now it's freezing. Yeah. I thought. I know the score doesn't look at it. I thought the Dolphins played a pretty gutty game given all the things that were stacked against them. The thing about the Chiefs, though, regardless of all the struggles this past regular season, when it's time to get to single elimination football, and they have so much experience. Yep. Patrick Mahomes is so aware of his legacy. He's trying to catch your former teammate Tom Brady. And you guys knew what it was like. Things change in the postseason. And you thrive in that. You don't get nervous. You don't get tight. You don't... You don't think about the consequences, you just go out and take it. That's what the Chiefs tend to do, regardless of how they get there, regardless of what seed they are. 
they just get it done. And the Dolphins may learn from that if they want to get to where the Chiefs currently are. Let's talk about Tua Tonga Bailoa. This was his best year by far. Led the NFL in passing. Started every game, which we thought was going to be unlikely for him. What does he need to do, Coach? I'll start with you. What's he need to do going forward to get to whatever the next level is for him? He just needs to keep doing it. This year was fantastic. I mean, you, you reflect back on how much success they had for about 80% of the season. They were phenomenal. It was the greatest show on grass. We hadn't seen an offense like this. Record-breaking numbers. Now, you could say, oh, it was against bad teams. It seemed like it was always at home. When they got into rough conditions or against a good team, he didn't play as well. They didn't play as well. That's a team thing. That's everybody. That's just not the quarterback. Yeah. The defense didn't play as well. They didn't coach as well. They didn't block as well. They didn't run it as well. So he's a part of that. He's a young player. It's hard to get quarterbacks in this league. It's hard to get a guy to build a program around. To have a guy who's had that much success and play at that level, now you just got to say, let's keep going. Let's keep growing. Your old teammate played till he was 45 years old. The ramp for quarterbacks is different now. The runway, they can play longer. The big thing is, do they approach it the right way? Do they keep growing? I say surround the guy, continue to help uh, make that team better around him. He'll continue to grow. He can be a quarterback that can win for a long time. Yeah, I agree with that. I think he has to continue on what he did this past offseason, allowed him to play 17 games. And I think he has to try to move past this game because in the football world that we live in, no one cares about what he did in the regular season. And it sounds crazy because how well he played, but everyone's going to remember when Tua plays in cold games, it's just not, it just doesn't happen for him. It doesn't go well. It looked like he struggled to throw the ball uh, Saturday night in Kansas City. So I think he needs to make sure he puts the right people around him mentally so he can stay focused on how to get better. Because I think this offseason, every time the Dolphins' name comes up, it's going to be how much do the Dolphins pay him? What do they do with his contract? And when he's in a cold game in the playoffs, we can't count on him. He can't be that guy that wins a game. Miami needs to do something different at quarterback. I think that's going to be a reoccurring theme all offseason. He's going to have to find a way to block that out and continue, like you said, to improve at the quarterback position. I also think, by the way, that the, the Dolphins need to help him out a little bit. Right? It's going to sound insane what I'm about to say. He needs more weapons. And I know see, that's crazy given that he's got Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, but it's fairly shallow, right? I mean, Waddle was less than 100%. Tyreek had been banged up as well the last couple of weeks. achan has been hurt most of the year um, in and out. Mostert was banged up. And so it's just like now he's throwing to Braxton Berrios and, you know, River Craycraft and Durham Smythe. And, like, you know what I mean? Like, But that's what happens Super when you spend the money on the top guys, I, I, you know? I get it. But I'm just I'm just saying, like, you know, they, they got they had so much success this year with, like, three or four guys. Yep. And so when you lose one or two of them, which is what happened, then it's it's a big difference when you're out there trying to face a really good Chiefs defense on the road with, you know, all due respect to River Craycraft and Durham Smythe. But, like, you know, they ain't the same guys. I, th I think a little bit to that point, but maybe a different angle on it is, I believe the best teams are physical. And, and so the more physical you are as a football team, the more burden you're taking off your quarterback. They are a high-flying act, right? It's fast, it's motion, it's this, it's that, it's down the field, it's all these different things that everybody's so impressed by. But when it gets into those moments, those tough, gritty moments, can they make the short yardage play, the goal line play, the stuff in the red zone, when the conditions are bad, on the road? you got to become a tougher team. And I think that starts up front. That starts with maybe a more physical runner. As great as those runners are, yeah. you need a guy who can run between the tackles. And all of a sudden, that alleviates some of the burden off the quarterback. Sure. Maybe that helps your defense, and it becomes a better environment for your quarterback to play well in the big moments. One thing that caught my ear after the game, Tua Tonga-Vailoa mentioned three or four different times the word communication when explaining issues with the offense late in the season, third down, et cetera. They got to iron that out. They got to figure that out. If there's communication problems, yeah. hard to make an offense go. If the play's not getting in or if the quarterback's not getting the information, they're not making the checks, they don't have the time, the play clock's running out, that makes an offense fall apart. So that's something to keep an eye on in the offseason as well. All right, the playoffs started with the Houston Texans declaring that, forget about the Cowboys being America's <laughs> team. They don't even Texas' team. The Texans are Texas's team. And they went after the Browns, Devin, and they got it done. That was an amazing performance, and the, the Texans are looking very good at the right time. I think what they have to love about it, it was a total team effort. They went out there. The offense played well. It wasn't just C.J. Stroud making plays. It was Bobby Slowick dialing up 
really good plays, misdirection, blocking didn't really – like, you saw so many different things. And then I thought the best part of it in the playoffs, that defense stepped up. Two oh. pick sixes. They played tough all game and made it tough on Flacco, which – we didn't see much. Flacco had his way with a lot of teams, so I thought that defense stepping up was big for this team going forward. The energy of the leader pervades the group. D'Amico Ryan's that head coach. Just what he's all about, what he represented as a player and as a coach, is all over that football team. Now, they've picked good players. The quarterback is something else. We haven't seen many rookie quarterbacks play at that level, and he was completely unfazed <laughs> by the moment. He embraced the heck out of it, but love what D'Amico's done there building that team. They play in his mirror image. Yeah, you know what? And C.J. Stroud, by the way, playing against the number one defense in yep. the NFL, zero turnovers, zero sacks taken, only three penalties for that whole offense. So, I mean, like, they they played really, really well. I will say, I also think, I think the Browns were exposed a little bit. Listen, Stefanski did an unbelievable job getting that team, losing Nick Chubb, losing, the, losing you know, all the quarterbacks, all the different injuries. They're in the toughest division in football. But the fact is, is that defense, the Browns' defense, has played a lot worse on the road this year than they have at home. They've beaten up on some bad quarterbacks as well that kind of padded the stats. And, and so getting on the road to Houston, I'm with you. Give Bobby Slow a, a credit, but and C.J. Stroud played unbelievable. But I think the Browns have been playing a little bit with house money. They, they'd had a lot of turnovers. They were one of the leaders in turnovers, and they've been getting away with it. But, Mike Flores, you and I both said on Football Night in America, we said, we don't think that's going to continue in the playoffs. You can't – Joe Flacco threw eight interceptions in his five starts prior to the playoff game. It's one of the reasons why one of my bets was Joe Flacco to throw a pick because, I mean, it's a great, unbelievable story. But there is also a reason why he was a free agent a available to be picked yeah. up. Well, there was a recklessness with the football, yes. and that's something Chris Sims was preaching. Be more conservative yeah. on offense. Don't throw the ball. It projected to 27 interceptions for the full season. So that was a problem for the Browns. But kudos to the Texans in the final eight, and no one would have seen that yep. coming. All right. We would have been talking about another Nico game that Ryan was played today. Coach of the year. Well, yes, but they cut it off at the regular season. I know. I'm just right. saying. We would have been talking about Bill Steelers today, but the game got postponed. Give me the one thing, one thing that you're looking for tomorrow when Pittsburgh and Buffalo get together. Josh Allen. I, I think – in this kind of atmosphere, in the playoffs, it will be what kind of game do we get from Josh Allen? Will it be some of the bad decisions, throws, or will it be that guy who's making plays all over the field, throwing it and running it? I'm looking for balance. I'm looking for a lot of Josh Allen, but also Cook, Diggs, Kincaid. Get these different guys involved. Not too much burden on anybody. If they play as a team offensively, they're hard to stop. I'm looking for them to dominate. Remember last year at this time, they almost lost at home to Miami to Skylar Thompson, the third-string, seventh-round rookie. Like, if it wasn't for a couple of, you know, uh, you know, time-expiring time penalties, they might have lost, like, down the stretch. So my point is, is that – and then, of course, they lose to Cincinnati in the next round. This is a team the Bills are much better than the Steelers. And I want them to do – I don't want them to win by a field goal. I don't want them to, you know, win on a last-second Josh Allen crazy drive. They need to dominate this game. They are at home against the Steelers, who snuck into the playoffs. This is a game the Bills, if they want to win the Super Bowl this year, need to dominate and show that they have that championship mentality. And I, and I think Pittsburgh will be confident, though. Yeah, like sure. Why they have no they problem. They went and played Baltimore at the end of the season. Yeah. They'll be confident. Nothing to 100%. lose. But still, I, I've looked at this game very simply. It's Josh Allen versus Mason Rudolph. Sometimes you don't really need to say anything more than that. All due respect to Mason Rudolph, although it's too late to – to avoid the all he does is win, point. though, right? That's true. That's all he's been doing lately. Just go out and cut it loose. <laughs> he, he, he might, he might got, be hearing about that. You got comment. nothing to lose. He got no, not after after three weeks ago. I got a lot more. I got a lot more room before you, I get. You got a lot again. of scars. But you, but, know you that, got, right? but, but, but let me tell you, you got nothing to lose. Yeah, so true. so who knows? All right, one big thing you're looking for: Monday Night Football, Eagles at the Bucks. Will Philly play any defense? <laughs> I think that's been the talk of everything. I know they've struggled on offense, but this defense and. I know everyone's killing, you know, it was Sean Desai now, it's Matt Patricia. But when you watch this team, one of the first things I look at, tackling. Does it look like they want to tackle? Are they going out there hitting people? They haven't done that. So I don't care what the call is, who's making the calls, unless you have 11 guys flying around, there, flying around out there on defense trying to put, I want to say a hit on guys or not hurt guys, but make sure they know you're there. It's going to be a struggle defensively. I'm even going before that. I'm going for their look in their eye, the bounce in their step, their body language. For the last month and a half, I, I can't recognize this team. Mm -hmm. They don't look like the same group of guys, how they interact with each other, the spirit they play with. So 
I think it's about that first and foremost. And then it's about tackling. Then it's about running the football. Then it's about the quarterback playing at a high level. But can they get their energy and juice back and play the way they're capable of playing? Yeah. And they're going to have to do it without A.J. Brown, which is a big piece of their offense. To your point, their defense has a struggle. I'm looking for Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield is one of the best stories in the NFL this year. He was a guy that they weren't sure who was going to be able to beat out Kyle Trask at the beginning of the year. He's played great. He's led them to a division title, and now he's got a home game, and he gets to go head-to-head -head with Jalen Hurts, one of the faces of the NFL, one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and everyone's sort of not thinking about Baker Mayfield, and I think the Buccaneers have a real chance in this game. Like, And so, uh, especially given how yeah. Philadelphia kind of limped into the playoffs, so I'm looking at Baker Mayfield. Like, it, This would be like kind of the completion of his redemption story, if you will, because it's been an unbelievable year for him. Winnable game for both teams. Somebody's going to lose, and it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. And like with the Eagles, you know, there's been these signs of dysfunction, and teams like to say there's nothing to see here, there's nothing to see here. And then once the season ends, you realize... <laughs> There's something to see. Time for the speed round. A little match game, and one match has already been made. It happened quickly on Thursday. Coach Bill Belichick out in New England, and then the next day we hear that your former teammate, Gerard Mayo, has taken over. Your first thought? I might be a little biased, but I, I think it's a great match. I think this is a, a young guy who came in, got away from football right away, retired, had a, a really great start to his career, a couple injuries, three injuries in a row. Uh, then he decided, you know, I want to be out of football. Coach Belichick calls him and says, hey, I could really use you coming back on staff. Comes back, and I remember talking to him when he came back in 2019 to football, and he said, if I'm going to do this, I want to be a head coach someday. So he's been thinking about this from day one when he came in. What can he learn from Coach Belichick? What can he bring from the business world that when he left football and he went and worked for somebody else and saw how someone ran a company? So I always tell people, when he became, you know, kind of the Soto co-defensive coordinator with Steve Belichick, he has CEO vibes. He always likes to talk to people, not just about football, but about how to kind of bring football to real life. And one thing he would always tell us on defense, everyone has their own canvas. You can paint whatever you want on the canvas to make our defense look like whatever it is you think will be best. But just make sure you stay on the canvas because we'll put every canvas together and we'll have an awesome mural. And when he would say that, I'm like, that's not football talk right there. Exactly. That's a guy that's running and, and leading people. That's why I think he'll do a great job in New England. I've always had so much respect for him from afar as a player. I can remember evaluating him in the draft. It's like, whoever gets this guy, <laughs> he's going to be really good for a long time. And football guy, everybody says such great things. You know him better than anybody. And, and he's a guy who's learned from arguably the best coach to ever do it. And, and, and I think he's going to put his own spin on it. He's going to take all the greatness from Bill, and then he's going to say, I'm going to go be Gerard Mayo. And I think it's going to be a good mix of doing things a little bit differently and evolving, but having a good foundation uh, that he's been steeped in. So I, I think I think it's a good move for the Patriots. I'm excited to see how they play. It was one of the he, he's one of those guys that always gets talked about. That guy's going to be a coach one day. So not the only thing that was surprising to me was that the Patriots didn't take a little bit more time. Would they have talked to Mike Vrabel, have him return? I, I you know I don't know. It was it was interesting that they moved so quickly. To replace a legend, which is that's you know, if, if you're gonna take your first head coaching job, that's a tough one. Having to replace, you know, the greatest coach of all time. First time I've ever became aware of that dynamic was Woody Hayes to Earl Bruce. I felt bad for Earl Bruce because it's hard to follow the legend, but it sounds like Gerard Mayo may have the chops to get it done. All right, let's make some matches with some of these other big names. We'll start with your former coach, Belichick. Where do you think he lands? This job's not available yet, but I think we've been talking about it earlier today. I think Dallas could be one of those fits because of, for one, Bill Belichick is 72 years old. This team is ready to win now. I don't think he really wants to be in a rebuild or, you know, we'll be good in five years. I think an opportunity to maybe be on a team and win as soon as you get there sounds like a good thing, but we'll have to see if that job is even available. Yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about the ones that actually are available, and I think the big thing for me with Coach Belichick is what the structure of the organization is. He's used to being the guy, the only voice in an organization where everything goes through him. He makes every decision. Now, will an owner give him that opportunity to do that again at 72? We'll see. Uh, right from the start, I always thought it was going to be Washington. You know, Matt Matthew's team, they've hired a, a general manager, and, uh, and we'll see how that dynamic works. I think they might be interested in a younger guy, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him go there. Uh, new ownership there, I think, is going to support him and give him everything he needs. I'll throw a curveball. The Chargers. I think Belichick knows he needs a quarterback. 
And I think the job out there right now that's got the best quarterback is the Chargers and Justin Herbert. So I'll say the, I'll say the Chargers. All right, another guy with New England connections that didn't get that job there, Mike Vrabel. Where do you think he goes? I think there's been a lot of talk about Bill Belichick to Atlanta. And I think I obviously said I don't see Bill Belichick there. And I think the next best thing to that is Mike Vrabel. When I used to talk to the guys in Tennessee that were from New England, I had that kind of familiarity with them in New England. They talked about Vrabel not being Bill Belichick, but a lot of the same type of things, hard practices, intense with pads, hitting people, that kind of tough, smart football team. So I think if Atlanta is interested in a Bill Belichick type of person, Mike Vrabel fits that mold perfectly. Yeah, Vrabel's a really good coach. I think he'd fit in a lot of places. I do think Ben Johnson's going to get one of these jobs. I think Washington and Carolina are probably interested in him. So if he goes to the one spot, I think Vrabel goes to the other one. I think he might end up in Carolina. I'm going to say Atlanta. I'm going to say, listen, they, they, last time they looked around, they're like, oh, we like what's going on in Tennessee. We'll take Arthur Smith. That didn't work out, but maybe go get his go back. former boss, <laughs> Bill Vrabel, uh, Mike Vrabel. I'm, I'm with you, uh, Devin. I think they want kind of that hard-nosed guy. And so Vrabel's a great coach, and I think he'll be a success wherever he lands. The Raiders are the one I'm watching right now. He's got the ties to Tom Brady, and Brady's – trying to become part owner of the team. If I'm Vrabel, I wait to see what happens because mm. you don't know what Mike Tomlin's going to do. Pittsburgh would be perfect for Mike Vrabel yeah. if Tomlin chooses to move on. And if Andy Reid chooses to move on, Vrabel played there too. He got traded by the Patriots to the Chiefs. That would be a great spot because there's still only one Patrick Mahomes. All right, last but not least, Jim Harbaugh. I think Harbaugh goes to the Chargers. I think for the Chargers, you have a young quarterback in Justin Herbert. I think bringing in an older coach like Bill Belichick is cool if you can win, but then it's like, all right, well, what do we do next? But I think what Harbaugh is a guy who's in college, just won a national championship. It seems like he's trying to get back to the NFL to have, you know, a long career. That's where he wants to finish it up. So I think that would be a great fit for him there. That's very logical. I think it would be a good fit. But uh, I'm going to go off the board. I think he's going to stay at Michigan. Wow. Mm. Wow. It was such an amazing week to watch him interact with everybody in that Michigan family. He talks about being a Michigan man. Mm -hmm. I think the probably – the two people he admires most as coaches are his dad and Bo Schembechler. And I think he loves the idea of doing that. There's no question there's this appetite to go back to the NFL and win a Super Bowl, be on the mountaintop in both areas. But I would not be surprised if he stayed in Ann Arbor. I wouldn't be surprised either, but just to throw something out there, look, I said earlier in the show that I think the Cowboys make a change. I'll say Dallas. Look, if you're going to move on from Mike McCarthy, who's had three 12-win seasons, it's got to be a big name. It's got to be it's got to be a splash. And I think for Harbaugh to leave Michigan, listen, Michigan's going to, you know, roll out the Brinks yeah. truck, right? You know, all those alums are going to be like, you got to stay, Jim. So if Jim's going to leave, it's got to be not only a good situation, but it's got to be a lot of money. And I think, I know he's been rumored to go to the Chargers, but the Spanos family previously hasn't been – you know, the most generous, if you will, it's more than to spend money, but Jerry will spend it. You know what I mean? Like if 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 uh, Harbaugh's out there for a price and J Jerry likes him, so I'll just as a wild card, I'll say I'll say the Cowboys. I feel like if he's if he's ever going to go back to the NFL, this is the year. Yeah. I mean, this is, and he's going to have multiple options. And I don't know that Seattle is realistic, but I would love for him to go back to the NFC West and face the 49ers <laughs> twice per year. That is it for now. Enjoy the games on Monday and enjoy the rest of the postseason. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.